Hello, this is June 26th, 2007. We're in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig, and our cameraman today is Dan McDermott. Dan is from the Natick Pegasus, which is our cable access station. We're privileged today to have Joseph E. Femia with us. Welcome, Joe. We're going to start off with a few personal questions. Uh, could I ask you when you were born? Uh, 05, 06, 25. May? May 6, 25. 1925. And where were you born? In Framingham. In Framingham, Massachusetts? Yes. And your current address is in what town? Framingham. You're still in Framingham? Yes, ma'am. So you were born there, you grew up there? Yes. And your marital status? Still married. Do you have children? Four. Four children. What about grandchildren? Two. Two grandchildren. What was it like growing up in Framingham back in the 1920s and 30s? Well, the Depression was on. Everybody had to survive some way or the other. We did. Did you come from a small or a large family? Large family. There were seven of us. And what did your dad do? He was a farmer. And where? What part of Framingham? Uh, Saxonville. Is it still a farm or has it been? Oh, it's been all developed. Okay. Where and when did you enter the military? Was it out of Framingham? Out of Framingham. Mm -hmm. When? What year? Well, on my 18th birthday, I went down and signed up with the draft. Then uh, a few weeks later, I got a let us say in to show up at the draft board on the 12th of Ju July. And you actually remember the date. And what year was that? Do you 1943. Remember? Why did you decide to sign up? I had to. It was a draft. It was compulsory. Everybody it was compulsory. Okay. 18 or over had to sign up. Did your friends also? Oh, yeah. It was mandatory for all of them? Everybody. Mm -hmm. What branch did you join? Uh, in the Army. I joined the Army. And did you have a choice in that matter? No. I tried to join the Navy. They didn't, they didn't want me. Why was that? Because I had bad teeth and I was underweight. And you were underweight. But the Army took you anyway. The Army takes everybody. Did friends and family members join with you? Uh, they joined, uh, they uh, were drafted at different times. My, my oldest brother was in the service already. He was the first sergeant in the infantry. <coughs> Where was he stationed? Fort, <coughs> Fort Bragg. Where were you sent initially for basic training? Uh, <coughs> excuse me, Camp Hood. And where is that? That was in, that's in Texas. Had you ever been out of Massachusetts prior to that time? No. Was it considered an adventure or just something to do? How did you feel about going to Texas? Sort of a relief. Why? In what way? Well, when I was home, I had to do a lot of work. Farm On and the farm? This was something new. And it wasn't that new after a couple of days, you know. <clears throat> did you adjust well? Oh, yeah. What was it like in basic training? Do you remember? Well, down in Texas, it got up to over 100 degrees. We had one fella in our unit die from heat exhaustion. How did that affect the rest of you? Well, it was sort of traumatic in a way, but nothing you could do about it. And he was young, 18 or so, like you? Yeah, same age, somewhere in the 18, 19. How long did basic training last, do you remember? Oh, I don't know. After basic training, we went to Camp Cass in Colorado for infantry training. We didn't know if it was infantry. We didn't know it was infantry at the time until we got there. So you knew you were going to Carson, Camp Carson. Or is it, was it Camp Carson then? Camp Carson then. Now it's Fort now Carson. Now it's Fort Carson. Okay. Um, uh, no, uh, we didn't know. We were just put on a train and we get up to where we saw the Rocky Mountains and. What was that like, seeing the mountains? Oh, that was beautiful. Was it? I assume you didn't have cameras back then available to take no. pictures? Mm -hmm. No. I... Once you were in the infantry part of it, did you, 
did you receive any advanced training beyond that? Yeah. What was it? It was more like uh, mountainous, training for mountain duty. Do you think that's why they sent you to Camp Carson? I am the slightest idea. How long were you there? Oh, a few months, then we went on maneuver out in California at Camp Roberts. So you really did a lot of traveling. Yeah. And the division was the 71st, 71st Infantry Division, a light infantry. Was that the one you stayed with? No. That one, they had, the mode of transportation was mules. We had mules. You had m mules back then? Yeah, to carry stuff. In California? In California, yeah. And how long did you stay at Camp Roberts? Uh, until uh, April. Then so that would have been April of 44? 44, yes. What ha were you hearing about war overseas? Well, we knew war had started on account of the, uh, December 7th. And we knew we were going to go sooner or later, be in infantry. So in infantry, did you rise above anyone else in any specialties, or did you get any specific training on any? Well. I didn't know I was a machine gunner until I got to Europe. And why did they decide you would be a machine gunner? Because it was my MOS. I didn't even know what my MOS was. Explain what an MOS is. Military Occupational Specialist. And that's information they write up on you? Yeah, they say you have a, you train for a certain MOS. Or they give it, give it to you. And in your case, you must have had good results with, in, with a machine with gun. With a machine gun. Yeah. So when did you go to Europe and how did you get there? The 8th of June in 44, we departed New York. And 10 days later, we landed in Liverpool on the 18th. And did you go by boat? Yes. What was that experience like? Well, it was crowded. And we were in a convoy, and most of the day would be out on the deck looking for submarines, because you never know where they were. And thank God we didn't see any, or nobody gets, no ships get sunk. And what about any rough seas or seasickness? No, it was very calm going yeah. over. So you're very fortunate. Yeah. Others that we have interviewed have yeah. had some experiences with yeah. seasickness. So. So coming back uh, in December, uh, December and January of. 45 and 46, it was rough. Well, we'll get to that yeah. a little bit later. Um, so you were a machine gunner. Once you got to Liverpool, what was your day like? Were you camped? Were well, you... we were in a camp, but we had to go get uh, shots for immunization or whatever you want to call it. And then uh, we sent all our personal stuff home. Was that something that concerned all of you, that you were really separating yourselves from no, your personal really. life? Not mm -hmm. really, because uh, we knew we were going into combat. Now how? Even then I didn't know I was a machine gunner. I had a, a, I trained with a rifle, so I figured that's what it's going to be. Okay. So when did you find out you were going to be a machine gunner? Well, we left Southampton. I think on the 20, 20th or the 21st, we went across. 20th or 21st of? June. 44. Four. And when we uh, got off the boat, we had to walk up off the beach and through an opening, you know, like a roadway. Now what beach was this? Omaha Beach. And. Uh, get up there and there's a sergeant with a whole list of names and he called my name out and he said over there, you know, point it over there and, and he said, you see that pile over there? He said, anything you don't want, throw there. That's where my gas mask went. I got rid of that and a couple other things. You now know. why did you get rid of your gas mask? Well, I don't know, we just did. We saw a pile of them there, so we got rid of ours too. They were awkward to carry, or yes, they were awkward to carry, and 
the only good thing about them, you could throw the, the, the inserts or the gas mask itself away and keep the, the uh, cover. It make a nice little side pack for you. And is that what you did? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're on Omaha Beach. Yeah. And Are you with your unit that you were with? No, they, we split up uh, a whole, whole bunch. Of, nobody from basic training uh, went with me. I had one fellow, a friend of mine from New Jersey, he went to an infantry outfit and he lasted one week and he got captured. And I was lucky to go to the armored division. So you were with the armored division, did it have a, a unit number or? Yeah, 36th, uh, 3rd armored division. 3rd armored division. And I was in the 36th armored infantry regiment. And did you get orders from this um, officer on Omaha Beach as no. to what you would be doing? No, he just said, follow the rest. Keep following the guy in front of you. And like I said, when we get up to the top, the sergeant was there and he called out names to put us in different groups. And that night we got on a truck and he, they drove us someplace. I don't know who the driver was, but they drove us someplace and told us to get out. Then in the morning, the first sergeant come along, and the first thing he did was take my rifle. I said, hey, I need that. He said, oh no, we got something better for you. So I didn't know what it was. So he takes us down to the machine gun squad, and he says, there's your thing up there. I said, what? He said, the machine gun. But he, oh, I'll be, go back a little bit. Before he, after he took my rifle away, he gave me a, a 45 pistol. And I said, what am I gonna do with that? That's when he said, I get something better for you. So the pistol was sort of backup. Well, it was a sidearm that mm -hmm. uh, martyr people, machine gun people, bazooka, like that, they carried the sidearm. Mm -hmm. Everybody else carried a rifle. So when he showed me the machine gun, that's when I found out I was a machine gunner. So then what happened? How long did you stay? Was it a camp you were in? No, just a line. Mm -hmm. You know, a line of troops and equipment. No camps over there then. And were you, did you have a destination that you were going to at no. the time? They just told us to, when we walked, we walked, when we rode. We, uh, most of the time we rode on the back of the tanks would put the machine gun up there and the guys would climb up. And just about every tank had a squad on it. And at this point, you're still in England? No, we're in France. I'm sorry, Omaha. France. You said Omaha Beach, my era. Um, when, when you hit Omaha Beach, was it after the first surge of? Oh, oh yeah, it was a couple weeks or so after D-Day. Had you heard anything about what happened on D-Day no, prior no. to arriving yourself? No, we knew, well, when we left the uh, United States, it was on the 8th, two days after D-Day. But we didn't hear anything about casualties or anything else, uh, fighting. So when you were on going on to the beach, was there any fighting going on then? No, Had not you, at the beach. They were the inland beach. probably five, ten miles. I don't know. As you went forward with your troop, your tanks, your machine guns, and obviously some of you walking. Yeah. Could you hear any um, fire, fire oh, firing yeah. in the field? All the time you hear firing. The first time you heard it was, what was it like for you? Scared. Mm -hmm. War isn't nice, you know. It made it real? It's a reality, and boy. The first American that I saw dead, he had a machine gun beside him. And here I am wondering, what, what, I'm, what did I get myself into? Sure, sure. Okay. So you were going forward, and how long were you traveling? Tell us a little bit about each, not each day per se, but the weeks as, after you landed in Omaha Beach. Well, some days we'd fight, and sometimes we'd be on the back of a tank going faster, and once the tank started getting shot at, we'd jump off and try to get the enemy. And it was that way all the way across. 
Now, when you say across, were you heading into Germany? We were heading, we were heading east in France. And I only lasted about 60 some odd days in combat. And why do you say you only lasted 60 well, days? I got, I got wounded with shrapnel. And tell us about that. Well, we started out in the morning from a little town south, south of Paris called Milly. How do you spell that? M-I-L-L-Y. And my assistant machine gunner was sitting up at the gun when we started out, probably four o'clock in the morning, something like that, five o'clock, I don't know. And we were going down the street through a town and there was a railroad tracks parallel with the road. And he said, Joe, why don't you come up and come up and sit in, at the gun instead of, because he was getting tired. I said, okay, John. So we swapped places. We went down the street, turned left to go into a small village and down that street there, about a couple hundred feet, a shell come through the gas tank, exploded, and killed four guys. And I ended up with shrapnel and burns. What about the gentleman who changed places with you? He died. What was that like for you? You were 18 years old at that time, right? 18 or 19? 19, 19, 19. 19 years old. What was that like for you? Well, we, we had seen, I had lost a machine gun squad before. When back in Normandy, I had the sergeant told me to go down this road. We were in the hedgerows. Go down this cart path, <clears throat> turn the corner, and set up the machine gun there. So we went down. I set up the machine gun, and right behind us on our right was a forest, like a woodlot. They were raising, or growing trees. Well, all of a sudden, the shell started coming in, bursting in the trees and everything else. And I looked around, nobody there, only me. I said, what the heck am I doing here? So I left the gun there and I ran. And I was running back up to where we started from. There was a guy ahead of me, he was wounded. He had blood coming out, of, out from underneath his helmet. And ahead of him was another GI. And I have to tell you right now, before that happened, I got rid of my 45 and picked up a carbine. So I was always carrying a carbine plus the machine gun. Now what is a carbine? It's a rifle, okay. small rifle. Mm -hmm. yeah, I could shoot that better than shoot the pistol. Mm -hmm. So I saw the GI, other GI running and I yelled at him to come back and help. He said, no, I leveled the, uh, the carbine at him. And I said, I'll shoot you if you don't come back. So he came back and the two of us, we carried the guy up and he got first aid treatment. I don't know if he lived or not because the blood was coming out from him under his head, mm -hmm. a helmet rather. That was your first experience? Yeah, that was the first one. So and then you fast forward to this, this tank that you're on and you switch places and in switching places you were saved and four others died. Yeah, that was a half track, not a tank. A half track, because explain that, a half track. Yeah, so. Because that morning there, we, the Germans were on the run to get out of France. And when we went down that road where we got hit, you could see the Germans retreating up another road off, oh, I don't know, half a mile, something like that. It was all farm country. But I was just lucky. So when you saw them retreating, did you see any villagers around or were they all hiding no, or were they gone? they were gone? all hiding because mm -hmm. they didn't want to get killed. Sure. So you, your, the other gentlemen that were hit and killed, you said you were injured with shrapnel. Hmm. Was it severe? Was it a severe? No, I had a piece in my leg, a chunk come out of there. I had a couple pieces here and one of the guys that got killed, the shell bursted and made him like Hamburg because I had him all up and down in front of me. Hmm. And when I, I got blown out of the half track. And Explain I, what a half track is. Half track is a, like a pickup truck with the wheels on the front and tracks on the back. Okay. And it's plated with armor. And it holds approximately how many uh, people? Well, there think? were six of us in it. Mm -hmm. And out of the six, four of you died? Four of them died, mm -hmm. yeah. The other machine gunner, a kid from Kentucky, he was on the back 
gun, the gun on the back, and he got blown out. He was sitting up on top of a, we had a rack welded on the back of the half track with all our sleeping gear in it. When the half track was with it, we could sleep. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we just slept on the ground. And uh, uh, Edgar on the back gun, he got blown out and he didn't get hurt at all. Thank God. Yeah. Now you were injured. Did, was there a medic around or did Edgar help you? No, there was a medic. We yelled for a medic and he come down, he jabbed me with morphine. And then somebody helped carry me back a little way. And I don't remember much after that until I woke up on the ground on a stretcher. And that's all I had on was my underwear, clean underwear. Because I had the same underwear from England for oh, 60 some odd days. The same clothes, they must have cut the clothes off of me. And, and was that, that was usual? It wasn't unusual well, I don't for know. all of you? Nobody, nobody carried extra clothing. Mm -hmm. So you had no choice? No, we uh, carried our uh, raincoat and shelter half was used to make a bedroll out of it. What was the weather like back then? Uh, some days it was wet and, you know, it wasn't good weather. Only a few days were sunshine and so forth. So were you admitted to a camp hospital or anything well, like that? Well, no, they put me, yeah, they, they put me on the ground someplace and the hospital wasn't there yet because the field hospital had it take time to break down, mm -hmm. pack up and catch up with us. And by the time they caught up with us, well, my wounds weren't that bad. I bled a little bit, but not too much. So how long were you out of commission? I, I like what? Um, meaning if your wounds weren't bad, did you go right back into Oh, them? no, no, I didn't go back in because I had a gash out of my bone, shin bone there and the doctor put me on limited service. But you stayed over there? I stayed over in France, yes, and I, they put me in a, uh, an outfit called the Habercraft outfit. Habercraft? Yeah. And what, what did that mean? It was a bunch of guys that had deferments during the war. They were rich kids, but they had boat experience. And they put them in this outfit, and they had small 26-foot boats to guide ships into the harbor, and also they had a couple of big 65-foot tugs to push the big boats. And there was about, six, say, 16 of us combat guys that joined this outfit. And where we didn't have any boat experience, they made MPs out of us. So uh, up in Belgium, when we were up in Belgium, we had a guard that docks down there, pulled guard duty, and also so you went from France to Belgium? No, I went from, after I got hit, wounded, I went to England, okay. to uh, the 81st General Hospital in Wales. Then after that, they reassigned me to the Habercraft outfit. And uh, every so often, every time they got a train loaded, let's put it that way, from the boat, they'd pick two of us guys and put, them on the, put us on the train and we'd guide the train to the combat zone. And we'd, we'd stop maybe five, 10 miles behind the combat, you know, the line. And leave the train there, then head back. And what's sort of funny about it, all railroads head back to Paris, <laughs> regardless where we were. <laughs> so you got to go back? We got to go back to Paris. Paris. Yeah. Were, when you did that, when you went back to Paris, were the Parisians friendly towards you? Oh yeah, we get drunk all the time. <laughs> so this was certainly a lot easier for you than being Oh yeah, on very the easy. And how long did you stay there doing the uh, uh, harbor craft? Oh, uh, right after v VE Day, we And went, for uh, the public, that was what date? Uh, victory in Europe. Right after that, they got us ready to go to the South Pacific. They boxed up all our gear and stuff and they shipped it off and we went to Camp Lucky Strike here uh, outside of Paris or Reims, near Reims. And then from there we went down to Marseille, ready for the boat to go to the South, 
South Pacific. And did you go? No. Why? Because the war in Japan ended. So we stayed there, and then after the war was over there, they came up with a point system. If you had enough points, you could go home. So I had a combat, I had so many months in combat, in combat or so many weeks in combat, that I had enough points, and I was in long enough, and over in Europe, and so forth. And so I said, I want to go home. Prior to going home, when you were ready to go to the South Pacific, and you had heard what happened in Japan, ending the war, or did you hear? Well, we heard that they bombed them with a, an atomic bomb, and we didn't know anything about it. You know, we, we didn't know what a, an atomic bomb was, because we, we were only used to the bombers that came over at night and dropped 500 pounders, you know? So when you heard about an atomic bomb, how soon after that did you learn what it really could do? I mean, uh, for instance, today we see it well, on the it news, was, I but... A, I think it was in the Stars and Stripes, okay. the devastation that happened over there in Japan. So was there a lot of conversation about that? Yeah, it ended the war. That was mid-conversation because everybody was happy. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't have to go to the South Pacific, and a lot more guys were saved, you know, lives were saved. So you're still in France, and now you can come home because you have enough points. Did you come home? Yes. How did you get home? Uh, by boat. On, uh, I think it was just before Christmas we set sail. So that would have been Christmas of? Uh, 45. 45. And on New Year's Day, we came up the uh, harbor in New York City, and we could see the Statue of Liberty, and there wasn't a dry eye in the whole bunch. Very heartwarming to oh, see the was. lady, huh? Yeah. And did your family know you were coming home? No. Had you had any contact with them? Did they know that you had been injured? Well, can I go back? Sure. When I was in combat, I hated to write. So my mother wrote to the Red Cross, trying to find out where I was. And they told her that I got wounded and I'm all right and he's in the hospital and all that. And they said, take a picture and send it home to your mother. I said, okay. So I went and had a picture taken from the waist up. So my mother started crying that I lost my legs. <laughs> oh dear. And, but I didn't, thank God. Did she learn soon after that you hadn't, since you didn't yeah, like well, to write? I, I just wrote her and told her I still got my two legs, you know. But I, like I said, I didn't have that much time to sit and write letters. I was more uh, in taking care of myself in combat, because nobody else looks after you. <laughs> sure. Did you make any friendships with those that you were with over there? Yeah, but the, the only... Five guys, uh, five guys I knew were in the back of the half track, and then the sergeant. I didn't even know the dri our driver. And four guys got killed, so I didn't get to know them too well. And one time we went down to Kentucky, to where Edgar King lived. And Edgar King was the other gunner? Yeah, the gunner. other survivor. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, ran, went to his town, and nobody could remember him. I said, somebody must know about him. Nobody could tell us anything about him, but that's what he has in the book. Uh, Sanders, Kentucky. We could never find him. So then the fellow, that, uh, the guy that took over the machine gun squad, his name, was, uh, his name is uh, Sergeant Tucker. He lives out in Kansas. And I was talking to him, and he had Edgar in his squad, the squad afterward. And Edgar always said that he was going to go to Texas. Now, maybe he went to Texas. I don't know. So you never found never him after? Never tried to find out, no. Yeah. When you mentioned about um, being treated and you were sent back to England to the hospital, did you feel that you got good quality medical care? Oh, yeah. I was in a good hospital. What was the name of the hospital? The 81st General Hospital down in Cardiff, Wales, or near Cardiff. In, uh, yeah, they were good. And every morning the doctor would come down, look at my wounds. Then he'd go to the next bed, 
and say to the guy, oh, you're the one that shot yourself. Did you see that happen a lot or hear about that happening a oh, lot? Oh, yeah. A lot of people would shoot themselves in the foot. In the foot. And one day we were in, in uh, waiting for resupply and there's this tanker sitting up on top of his tank cleaning, cleaning the submachine gun. All of a sudden, two shot, bang, bang, right through his foot. This was considered a quick way to get home, do you think? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure, a lot of guys shot, shot their foot. And when I was in the 81st hospital, two brothers, twins, they came from the Midwest. They were, sh they were shot, too. Right through the meat on your thigh here. Right through one leg, both legs. Each one of them had the same shot, so you, you can draw your own conclusion. Sure. Perhaps they did it to each other just or... Just to get out. Just to get out, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of GIs killed. Did you have a chance to have any kind of R&R &R, uh, rest and... No. The only thing we got for rest is when they were resupplying us. Mm -hmm. That was it. <laughs> Resupply and rest. That's R&R. &R. <laughs> so you came back through New York and it was very emotional for all of you. Did you stay in New York for a while because there no, was a lot we went of activity down, going We went on? down to Fort Dix. New Jersey? Yeah. And how long did you stay at Fort Dix? A couple of nights. And then did they give you your walking papers or did no, it take we had, a while? No, they, uh, they sent me to Fort Devens and out. And did you go by train? Yes. At that point in time, did your family know you were home yet? No. Mm. I didn't, I didn't, like I said, I didn't, I don't, I didn't like to write. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't just pick up a phone at that point in time. There was no phones around. Sure. So from Fort Devens, what happened? Did you stay there for a considerable no, amount of time? Couple, two days, I guess, and I got out. You would complete, at that point, discharged? Discharged. An yeah. honorable discharge yeah. from Fort Dix. And how did you get home from there? Uh, they, took, they gave us a bus ride down to Worcester. And Worcester, they... Gave me a train ticket to go to Framingham, and they said goodbye. What was it like coming home after all of your experiences as a now almost 20-year-old? Oh, I don't know. I didn't ever thought of it, really. I mean, we had a job to do. We did it. And when I was in the hospital, they had me in the uh, ward where people have uh, nightmares. No, I was there for a while. Did you have nightmares? I have the slightest idea. They didn't tell me anything, but I sent away for a copy of my medical records, and I got a complete copy day by day from the VA. And it says I was there for, I don't know, 30 days, something like that. When you say there, in, the, in, in Wales? The, yeah, in Wales, at the hospital. Third, so you were there for a And they put down, months. still having uh, nightmares, you know. And after a while, I guess it disappeared because they, they, they said, all right, for reassignment. But you don't remember those nightmares? No. Have you had any since then? A couple of times. Mm -hmm. Do you find, because of the popularity of things such as Brokaw's book on the greatest generation and the movies that have come out that more um, members of your generation are willing to talk about their experiences? Yeah, well, uh, like I said, it's an experience to be in combat. And where I was in the armored infantry, it wasn't as bad as the regular infantry, because the regular infantry, they walked all the time. Maybe once in a while they jumped on a truck, uh, you know. Went. But the tanks, the third armored, we were in the first army under General Hodges, not Patton now. And when you smile about Patton, did you hear stories about him? Yeah, he should have been shot. <laughs> no, seriously, he got all the glory. I mean, the third, the third armored, we lost almost four thousand guys. In the infantry part of it, we are, we are, uh, accounted for oh, about two thousand or more of those four thousand, because we had a lot of deaths. 
But the, uh, the regular infantry, they had a heck of a lot more. Like mm -hmm. the 3rd Infantry Division, they had up about five or 6,000 killed. And, uh, but with the armored, we rode till we got shot at, and we'd jump off and fight, and hoping that wasn't too much there. And, and after it calmed down, we'd get on the tank again and go someplace else, and the infantry would come in behind us and clean it up to secure the areas. But, and they, like I said, <coughs> one, one day we were down near Mortain in France. In France. Mm -hmm. And we got an order to go down this, go on this, uh, oh, on a scouting mission because we got word that the Big Red One, the first division, got, got surrounded. So the crew got on the tank and the tank, we went down this road and we come to something like a little clearing and we see a GI over in the corner uh, on a banking, and he's wounded. So I jump off the tank, and the tank uh, sergeant come out, and we run over to him, and <clears throat> we asked him what happened. He said, I got hit, you know? <laughs> so there's no medics around either, because we were the only tank in that area. But while we were trying to figure out what to do with him, we heard a shell come in. And that shell landed, oh, maybe 100, 100, 150 feet down the road. And it bounced, and it bounced, and it bounced. It landed from here to the corner away from us. And we were waiting for it to go off. It never did. And, what, 60 some odd years later, I found out why. Why was that? It seemed that the artillery, the guys, the, the guys from the Big Red One, they needed ammunition and food. They took out the charge out of a 105 shell and stuffed ammunition in it and some K ration. And they'd fire them in there. They were, I think they were marked somehow so the guys could find them. But the battery for the walkie talkie was so big it wouldn't fit in the 105. So they took out the powder charge out of a 155, which is about that big around. And they put the battery in that. And that's what we think was in that shell because a guy told me how they had fired dummy shells like that into the, 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 the first division. But you found out after the fact, yeah, many, six, many years, years later. later. My gosh. And I mean, you know, we knew the, uh, when the, the first division was uh, cut off, but we didn't know they were firing stuff into them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you came home, did you go back to working on your dad's farm? Uh, no, I uh, worked on construction a little bit. And in between times, I went to school. Now, did you go to school for a degree or? Uh, for just for, well, I went to school for drafting and machine design. And did you follow that career path? Oh, yeah. I went to work at Fenwell. In Ashland. Ashland. I, I uh, worked there for 10 years, then in 1960, that was from 1950 up to 60. Mm -hmm. And after that I went to work for the U.S. Army in Nat uh, Natick Laboratories. I worked there for 22 years. As a civilian? As a civilian. <laughs> what rank did you um, leave the Army as? PFC. But you also got some medals. Oh, yeah. With all of those there and $2, I can get a cup of coffee. <laughs> we will show, um, at the end of this interview, we'll show the beautiful arrangement that you've brought in with your remarkable medals. Once home, did you talk about any of your experiences? Not really, because who wants to listen to people getting killed? Did people think you had changed? I don't know. I never asked them. Mm -hmm. Did you join any veterans organizations? I did join the VFW in Framingham. Are you still a member? Uh, no. I dropped out because of reasons. And then I, uh, they started up uh, the military out of the Purple Heart in Framingham. 
And we were doing good, but all of a sudden, people started dropping out or dying. You know, after a while, there's nobody left. So I didn't join any other outfit for years, and then I finally joined the VFW up in Ashland. And Do you still belong to that group? Yes. I could belong to the DAV, because I get a disability from the government. When you were going to back to school, did you use the GI Bill? Yes. And how did you meet your wife? Oh, that's a long story. Let's go back into Paris. One day, we, I was in Paris during the war. And my wife's uncle was a friend of mine. I had his uh, military address. He was down in Fontainebleau, which is about 15 miles south of Paris. So I went into the Red Cross and I had his address and I said, I'd like to know where this outfit is. I want to go see my friend. And they said, oh, we can't tell you that. That's a secret. I said, you've got to be kidding. He's in the post office. <laughs> he was in the military post office. So I said, the heck with you. I used the other word, but I walked out. Who do I bump into but Frankie? The uncle. The uncle. So the first thing we did was get a bottle of cognac. And we got, we drank and drank. We got so drunk that he had to get on the, uh, the uh, go to the South Station in Paris to get back to Fontainebleau. We get down there, and I'm so bad I couldn't remember anything. I was laying on the bench, and I saw the the French people looking down on me, and I kept saying MPs, MPs. So the MPs came and got me and took me back to their barracks where we stayed. Every time we went to Paris, we stayed at the MPs because we had firearms, and we had to leave them there. So to this day, I don't remember being picked up, but we had a good time. And right near, Par right near the Eiffel Tower, there's a pool and goldfish in it. Here we are pouring cognac in <laughs> <laughs> give, give it to the fish. You know. oh, we had some good times there, though. Now, was he from this area and your wife he, from this well, area also? Uh, we grew up together. We went to school together. And uh, my wife was his niece. So we used to, she used to go up there to visit her grandmother and so forth. And one day I, I walked in and she had a date with somebody else. She canceled it and we went out. <laughs> and the rest is history, yeah. you might say. 60 years. How important, Joe, do you feel serving in the military was? I think everybody should go in the military for two or three years. Why? It will teach them how to use weapons, and also to be ready for anything in the future. How do you feel, in what ways it, did your experience affect your life? I didn't let it affect my life. I lost some time being in the service, but on a whole I had a good time wherever I was except combat. Looking back, was there a memorable experience or a character or a humorous experience? I think you mentioned the cognac in the well, pool. The, but the one with the gas mask. Mm -hmm. Talk uh, about that. Uh, it was, I think it was the 24th of July, 44. We were getting ready to push off for the big breakthrough at St. Lowe. And sometime during the night, someone come running through yelling gas. And we just had a medic come down from his unit to ride with us. And he left his gas mask, mask back at this unit. So he had to run all the way back and get it. And when he came back, we asked him if he held his breath up and down. <laughs> <laughs> but in the meantime, none of you had your gas masks, did you? No. But what it was, they were yelling gas because it was a gasoline truck to gas up all the vehicles. We didn't know that. Until later, we said, oh, that's the gas man. He's delivering gas. <laughs> but we didn't know. So a scary yet at the oh, end. Oh, yeah, humor, humor at the end. And, uh, well, also, the artillery, artillery had been firing. And the residue from them, the smoke, would be drifting over us. And it has like an acid smell. And people were saying, oh, that's gas, that's gas. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't know. 
I mean, we didn't know what gas was. We went through the gas chambers down in Texas, but we didn't know what to expect. Sure. Do you have one thought or incident you'd like to share with your family or others who might see this tape? I know that a lot of what you've said is, is quite well, remarkable. <laughs> my family, there's only, uh, I got two sisters left. The uh, other four have passed away. And my sister, older sister, she was in the wax and her husband was, they were both in the Army, the Army Air Force, I believe, at the time. And my other sister, her husband was in the Navy. So none of them like to hear anything. So. They don't like to talk about it. Well, I never see them that much now. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we haven't asked you or any additional comments you'd like to make before we end yeah, this interview? Yeah, there's one about Oh, I don't know what time it was. There was a push to meet the British at the town of Felice. So we were on the tank and we got to a certain point and we got off. I set the machine gun up on a bank and I could overlook a field maybe, oh, 400 feet across, something like that. I didn't have a ruler, but, and over there we saw an 88, which is a artillery gun, with the barrel straight up in the air. So the sergeant said, Joe, take the guys and go over and see what goes, what goes with that 88, shell, uh, 88 field gun. Now was that an enemy? Yeah, the German, okay. German 88. Mm -hmm. Very nice weapon. So I started across the field. We started across the field crawling. I had the machine gun cradled in my arms. How heavy was the machine gun? Oh, about 30 some odd pounds. Because I lost one earlier. And they gave me a new one. The first one was what they call an A4. The second one was an A6, which had the shoulder stock on it. And instead of a tripod for the stand, they had a bipod, two legs. Mm -hmm. And I had to carry that. So we get maybe halfway across the Field, and all of a sudden we heard something go over our head and it wasn't a rifle it had to be an anti-tank gun and I think it was the British because that we're supposed to meet the British in this town and they saw us coming across the field so they fired one right over our head so we turned around and went back <laughs> did do you think they were firing because they thought you were the enemy near no that? no they just firing. I think that's to scare us so they didn't they didn't want to meet us to get all the glory you know being in Fallet they wanted the glory for I don't themselves. Know. That's all I know. Perhaps. It, it came over our head. I don't know how high it was over our head, but not too high. But we turned around and crawled all the way back and said, the heck with it. Well, Joe, we want to thank you, Mr. Joseph E. Femia, for coming in today and telling us a remarkable story. Uh, somebody's been watching out for you a number of times, oh, haven't somebody they? Did. We want to thank you again for participating in this program. I uh, thank you. <laughs> It's beautiful. The most important one is this one right here. The, uh, you've got two of those. Yeah, combat infantry. And I noticed anybody, it on your belt. Yeah, anybody can get the purple hat. Anybody can get the bronze star. But only the infantry can get that infantry badge. Mm -hmm. You have to be a dog face. And three spearhead was your group? The third. Third. Up here? Mm -hmm. Third army. And we were spearhead. In fact, the day I got hit, General Rose, our general, he was in the vehicle or the jeep ahead of us. And they let him go by, but they hit us because we blocked the road because there's going to be uh, there's woods coming up on each side, and we just got to the point where we blocked the road for everybody. And I don't know how many vehicles there the Germans hit that day. Do you want to explain some of these other ribbons also? Oh, yeah. Mitch. This was being a good conduct, being a good boy. A good guy, okay. This is the German one. This is the ETO. What is ETO? I don't know what this one is. I don't know.
Freedom Medal. Oh, the Freedom Medal. Freedom Medal. But our outfit, when they went into Belgium, I wasn't with them because I was in the hospital, but the Belgians really appreciated what we did. Every time the, gay, the guys went over there, you know, the, uh, for a reunion or something, the Belgians would roll out the carpet. Everything was free. The hotel, the food, everything, you name it, they'd give them everything. 